Good afternoon, everyone. Okay. So today I will be presenting, are you partial to amputating prior to endovascular intervention? So this case was a 59-year-old male. He was complaining of a non-healing, progressively worsening right great toe wound associated with purulence, redness, pain, and swelling of two weeks duration, which he had attributed to after clipping his toenails independently. He was also concerned for discoloration of the left second toe of two months duration. He denied any constitutional symptoms at the time, said he was feeling well. Um, his medical history includes morbid obesity, diabetes mellitus, non-insulin dependent, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, surgical history, he had surgical management of a left ear CSF leak many years prior, uh, social history employed, lives alone, he quit smoking 25 years ago, um, had previously smoked half a pack per day for three years and denied alcohol consumption and illicit drug use, does have a positive familial history of coronary arteries and diabetes as well. His vitals and lab results when he came into the emergency room at Lenox, um, his BP was stable, heart rate was elevated to 133 beats per minute, respiratory rate was elevated as well to 22 breaths per minute. Um, all others' vitals were within normal range. His white blood cell was elevated to 17.80 with a left shift, significant 88.1% neutrophils. ESR, CRP were elevated as well, correspondingly 110 and 312, significant for infection. His hemoglobin A1C was 10.2, so we can see he was very uncontrolled, and his vasting blood sugar was 282. Um, so at this point, as a resident, you know, we kind of take a collective view of what his vitals were, what his lab results were, and it was clear that he was septic. He did meet three out of the four SIRS criteria and did have a known source of infection being the right great toe. Um, so this put us all on high alert and knew that there was definitely a sense of urgency in treating him quickly. So these are pictures to kind of go with that presentation. So you can see his right great toe was in bad condition. Um, and he did have this corresponding plantar medial wound as well. Um, so his right DP was non-palpable. His PT was one out of four, had corresponding erythema and non pinning edema extending towards the midfoot. The left foot, um, he was concerned about the Second dusky digit, his corresponding left DP and PT were both one out of four, so faintly palpable. Um, there was no erythema or edema to the left foot. Um, as you saw, there was necrosis extensively to the distal tip and plantar surface of the right great toe. There was significant skin sloughing, and all of that kind of amounted to this Wagner grade three ulceration um, that did probe to bone. Um, the left foot, as I mentioned, had a second digit that was dusky discoloration. Um, so we already suspected there was some kind of vascular compromise. Um, numbness to the right first ray as well. Um, sensation intact to the remainder of the dermatomes had maintained his muscular strength and adequate range of motion. Here are the corresponding radiographs. Um, so as students, we are presented with the top five podiatric emergencies. So this patient certainly did have one of those. He had significant subcutaneous emphysema within the first and second interspace. Um, so the first image here of the right foot, um, just highlighting that first interspace um, there, and then just a zoomed in view. Um, and then we can see on the lateral view that it was present along the dorsal midfoot. Um, so we knew we had to take this to the OR pretty quickly. And something to just draw your attention to, uh, when we have a patient that presents with subcutaneous emphysema, everyone is on high alert, but it's always important to remember, although we're hyper-focused on treating the foot, we always want to make sure we get tip fib films to make sure that the gas is not ascending the lower leg. Um, so never want to miss that because that definitely would have led to a different surgical management of this patient if he did have gas ascending the lower leg. Um, zooming in on his uh, lower leg and foot radiographs again, um, just drawing attention to the arteriosclerosis. Um, we can see the beginning changes. So he did have some digital calcifications, some calcifications along the posterior tibial on the left side and the anterior tibial on the right side. Um, so even before this patient had any kind of diagnostic or non-invasive testing, we can see, you know, he could be 
set up for failure at this point. So after he underwent uh, surgical management in the OR on July 13th, he had a partial first ray resection. Um, so we definitely had to eradicate the gas that was within that first interspace. And then you could see along the dorsal surface of the foot, extending towards the midfoot, that incision was extended to reach over into the second interspace to evacuate the subcutaneous emphysema from that area as well. Um, and you can see from this clinical picture, um, it was definitely an aggressive surgery, um, by no means pretty, but we had to control the source of infection. Here are the corresponding post-operative radiographs. Um, you can see on each of these views um, the tubing of the wound vac. Um, so once hemostasis was achieved, the surgery was performed on July 12th, and then on July 13th, once hemostasis was controlled and there was no longer any active oozing, the wound vac was applied. Um, so you can just see that in those images here. Uh, from that index procedure, some of our microbiology and pathology results, uh, we collected two surgical swabs, um, both showing MSSA and Proteus mirabilis and mixed anaerobic flora. And then we also sent a sample of the right metatarsal shaft. Um, so that was our clean margin, so to speak. Um, be but because of how extensive we presumed the infection was, there was positive growth on this clean margin as well. Um, so we knew he would likely require long-term antibiotic treatment in similar organisms, MSSA, uh, Proteus mirabilis, um, and Bacteroides fragilis being the primary anaerobe. Um, so that kind of took us through our first admission. Um, the patient was discharged to a subacute rehabilitation center on July 20th. Infectious disease was on board. Um, they had recommended six weeks of IV antibiotic treatment with ceftriaxone and metronidazole. Uh, PO. Uh, but then unfortunately on July 29th, he returned because he wasn't happy with the subacute rehab facility. Um, so he returned um, that day and we took advantage of that second admission and chose uh, to graft the amputation site with Theraskin. Um, so we did that on August 2nd and then on August 3rd, um, considering that he was just discharged, you know, a week prior, um, he was already set up with the wound vac still and still had the left upper extremity pick line. So he was able to be discharged on August 3rd to a different uh, subacute rehabilitation center, uh, which he was happier with. Um, and here, this image um, is just a character depiction of what that TheraSkin um, graph looks like. And then the uh, small corner shot is kind of the bolster dressing we created over the TheraSkin graft. And I'd like to just draw attention to uh, the three different phases um, of how Theraskin is incorporated. So there is imbibition, inosculation, and revascularization. Um, and I would say that's the most crucial portion that we were most concerned with for this particular patient because we're relying on the patient's circulatory status to regenerate those new capillaries that will allow the graft to incorporate. So here, this was the patient on August 9th. He did uh, follow up with us in our outpatient clinic. So you can see that the Theraskin graft has started to incorporate centrally, um, but around the edges, you can still see that mesh pattern um, and all of our kind of proline ties that corresponded to the bolster dressing before we removed it. Uh, this was the patient August 16th, um, so you can certainly see there's still a slight film corresponding to the graft, but it's definitely incorporated more so. So the biggest question uh, we have is, should the patient have undergone an angiogram or some sort of intervention prior to or soon after the surgery? Um, as I mentioned, he did have a case of subcutaneous emphysema or gas gangrene, um, so we didn't have time to really waste or deliberate. Uh, vascular was on board from the index procedure, but there was a sense of urgency to control the infection. Um, but just considering where this patient's infection was and where he had the partial first ray amputation, um, the biggest concern was if he had flow um, to the dorsalis pedis corresponding to the anterior tibial artery angiosome and to the medial plantar artery. Um, so just covering that medial plantar aspect of his partial first ray um, corresponding to the posterior tibial artery angiosome. Um, so when we think of endovascular intervention, the biggest thing is if we can open up these large vessels so that he did have appropriate circulation. Um, so just a few literature 
um, pieces I have here. So the first one was published in the Journal of Vascular Surgery in 2017. So this was kind of like a global uh, review of 19 cohort studies. A uh, large number of patients were included, almost 4,000. Um, all the studies were observational in nature. They were all retrospective, um, but they used the uh, Newcastle and Ottawa classification, and they were all graded seven or above. Um, so they were deemed as high quality. All the patients in these 19 studies uh, were deemed to be Rutherford classes four, five, or six, so ranging from ischemic rest pain all the way to major tissue loss. Um, I would say this patient definitely probably fell within the Rutherford class five at this point um, because it was still isolated to one digit. Um, the past strategy that they address is indirect revascularization. Um, so it's just opening up any of the infrapropleteal arteries, but not directed to the area of the wound. Um, but direct revascularization is different in the sense that um, revascularization is targeted to the area of the wound, specifically within that angiosome. So for our patient specifically, we would want to see if he had flow within the anterior tibial or posterior tibial angiosomes. Um, the next study I have, a bit more recent, 2019, so the advantage to this one was that it was prospective. Um, they did direct revascularization for a majority of the patients. You can see that 113 underwent direct revascularization and 70% of those in that group healed. Um, so the largest majority in patients at hand geosome directed revascularization are successful. And then just in conclusion, um, in one of our own journals, uh, the Journal for an Angle Surgery, Dr. Dorio and his team in California in 2020, um, they were just trying to figure out what the sweet spot is. Um, in our case, it was important to control the source of infection, um, but Dr. Dorio and his team just wanted to emphasize that there's no defined algorithm for vascular timing and surgery. Um, so their sweet spot at this point is to do the intervention sometime between 15 to 60 days after intervention to allow for improved healing, but the caveat was in the absence of infection. Um, so although they did include patients that had infection, ischemia, or both, and that did not affect healing, um, doing it between 15 to 16 days allows the patient uh, for the best chance to heal. Um, so just how is the patient doing today? He's cleared his infection. Um, he's continuing to heal for secondary intention. Um, he's following up with the vascular team as well, and we're hopefully going to get approval for a second application of Theraskin. Um, so just some takeaway points. Um, did him, did this patient having palpable pulses mean anything? He still would have needed some form of intervention. Um, how can we improve our protocols moving forward? So I think just greater involvement, having him optimized from the beginning. Um, he probably should have gotten some form of ampu um, intervention or at least an arterial duplex just to get a better sense of what his circulation status was. Um, and would he have healed faster um, if he did? have some form of intervention. And here are my references. Thank you so much.